Hello everyone, it's BioPhoenix here, and as you can probably take a guess, yes, I'm taking a look at another PS1 game that is only in Japan, and that happens to be a very strange one. And word of warning, I will probably butcher this name, and that happens to be Eblar Laputa no Karumachi. So the first thing that is pretty strange is that, you know how we got a lot of games based after movies, animes, and food products? Well, in this one, it's actually based after a series of paintings all done by Naohaisa Enoi. Well, that's definitely a unique concept that you don't see very often. So the game was developed by System Psychom, and it was published by TVSI, and it was released in 1997. But before I start talking about the game, I do have to mention one thing that I thought was pretty amusing, is that there's actually a few websites that do talk about this game, but they actually got something uh, slightly wrong. Now I said that this game was based after paintings done by Inoue. Well, apparently a lot of websites say that the artist was actually Hiroshi Nagai. But as great as his pictures are though, it doesn't look anything like the ones in this game. But before we write them off as being, like, uneducated about it, well, to be fair, there is actually a PS1 game that is only in Japan where he actually did do the artwork for. And that happens to be Kaze no Notam, and no, I'm not going to be reviewing this game because literally all it is is just you fly a hot air balloon with some relaxing music. And if I did review it, it would be like a minute long or something, so yeah, not really much to say here, but now let's finally start moving on and start talking about Illblard, or Eblard, or whatever Blard. Hell, it could be Blarga Blarga for all we all know. So this game is an adventure style game that is done in the first person view, but we'll get talking about the story first, which should not take long at all, given that this game has yet to be fan translated as I'm doing this. So it seems like you play as some student, unfortunately I don't know the name of him, but he opens up a book and suddenly he's transported into a whole other world, and that happens to be the world of Eblard. And within this psychedelic fantasy world, he has to go around collecting gems, because the gems in this world are all scattered all over the place, and because of that, this world is having some strange issues. But the supporting characters that tend to help you out here and there happen to be a mole, a frog that looks kind of like Slippy Toad, and even some girl that kind of looks like an Enka singer. So that covers that, and surprisingly, this game is actually pretty easy to understand its story, even though there's like barely any text in the game, and whenever there's talking, you know, it's not in English, obviously. Because the storytelling of this game seems to be more visual. But let's get moving on and talk about the game's gameplay. So you walk around in these worlds that are based after paintings, and your main objective is to get a crystal and to continue on on either a train or a spaceship that you get later on. But to get the crystals though, you gotta do some problem solving, usually in the form of puzzles. But don't worry though, most of these puzzles are nothing super convoluted or anything. They're mostly just like collecting an item and then bringing that item to a certain spot. And strangely enough, you actually do get a boomerang, and yes, you can actually attack things with it. But before you start thinking that this game is gonna have like a shit ton of action, well, no, it doesn't really have much at all. Most of the time you're gonna be using the boomerang just to fend off like some random animal that could possibly bump into you, or even throwing it at a spaceship that tries to attack you, or even launching a broom at an elephant. Wow, I never thought I'd ever say that in a sentence. So knowing this, yeah, this game is obviously not an action game, even though it does have like an quote-unquote attack button, but you really don't use it all that much. But one last thing I will mention about the gameplay is that as you're exploring around, you will actually find some paintings scattered throughout, and if you click on them, well, it brings you some information. Now, when I first saw this, I was just thinking it might have been like maybe a little bit of history about like the painting and what it's about and its meanings. Well, they actually give you hints throughout the game. And in case you're wondering how I know this since I can't read Japanese, well, I actually use the good old-fashioned Hiko method. So you're probably wondering, what the hell's the Hiko method? 
Pretty much, you take your phone, you download the Google Translate app, then you use the uh, the camera option, and then you have your phone set it in an area where that it is uh, in place, like a tripod, and then you set it in front of your TV or screen, and, well, the text will be translated from Japanese to English, at least on your phone, that is. Of course, the best way of doing this is with a Chromecast, but because I don't have one, I had to use the lower budget standard. Which still works really well, but as great as this app is though, and as genius as an idea it is, unfortunately, the app itself is a little bit hit and miss with its translation. Sometimes it works well, and sometimes it just brings up random gibberish. But strangely enough, for this game, for the hint paintings, it actually worked quite well. In fact, for this painting right here, which I really do like, by the way, it says something along the lines of, The dinosaurs are very shy, so don't get too close. And I know this is accurate because when I got too close to one of the dinosaurs, it tried to eat my face off. So my conclusion is that I know what the paintings are for. But now let's get moving on and start talking about the controls. So for the most part, the controls in this game are pretty decent for what they are. Obviously, you move around with the D-pad, circle selects things, X cancels things, square is to throw your boomerang or your broom, and L1 and R1 allow you to strafe, and R2 allows you to turn on the heads-up display off and on. But now you're probably wondering, well, how are you supposed to look up and down in the game? So I gotta be honest, this is probably the worst part of the controls, is that looking up and down in the game is just very bizarre, even for back then. So what you have to do is that you have to hold L2, and then as you're holding it, you either press triangle to look up, or X to look down. And just by the way, it almost took me like 30 minutes just to figure that out. So that's a pretty fucked up control scheme just to look up and down. I mean, I would have at least accepted them to be just L2 and R2 like a lot of games at the time had. So yeah, other than the fucked up control scheme of looking up and down, everything else is pretty standard stuff and does work pretty well. And also I found that the game doesn't really run that slow. Yeah, so turning around in this game isn't nearly as slow as, like, turning around within the game Eru. Although, at least in Eru, you actually did have a run option, where this game you don't, unfortunately. But the standard running speed for this game, though, is really not that bad. So overall, I don't have any major complaints, except for one. So now, let's get moving on to the game's graphics, and man, what can I say about this? This game is actually really freaking good looking for 1997 standards. Even looking at it now, it still has a very nice charm to it. So I'm sure as you can tell already, this game is more about the art direction. And yes, the art direction in this game is pretty freaking great. So all the backgrounds are really nice looking and really do fit the, the painting style that he uses. And the game has a lot of nice bright colors and just some really cool designs and areas to the game. Now just as a fun little fact, now the painting that you see at the title screen, and also does show up later in the game, well, that painting, believe it or not, actually heavily inspired the Studio Ghibli film, Whisper in the Heart. And apparently that original painting is still being hung at the main building of Studio Ghibli, so that's actually pretty damn cool. But yeah, I know a lot of people are gonna call me crazy for saying that this game, like, looks nice even though it has that early 3D look that hasn't aged well, but here's the thing though. At least this game has a very nice art style and charm to it that still looks really cool and interesting, where unlike some other PS1 games that tried to look very realistic, yeah, those are the ones that look really ugly. But yeah, overall, I still think this is a really good looking game, even for an early 3D game. And one word that would fit this perfectly is... Aesthetic! But now, as for the game's music, oh damn, the music in this game is just fantastic. A lot of very nice, relaxing, chill music that is just so damn good. It fits the game really well, and there's really no bad song within the game. I think all of them are really good. And I've never heard of the composer that did the music for this game, but he happens to be Naoki Jinbo. And the one game that I'm actually kind of familiar with that he did the music for was the game Lunacy on Sega Saturn, and that is actually a pretty great thing because Lunacy's music is also pretty damn good. But yeah, the music in this game is not only underrated, but also I'd say that it is just overall really great stuff. I would highly recommend listening to the OST. 
So now, if you want to go out and buy this game, well, good luck, because I literally couldn't find it on eBay, so I have no idea how much it would go for if you did happen to stumble upon it. So knowing that, I would imagine that this is probably a very hard game to find out in the wild, even for Japan. So now, what are my overall thoughts on this game that I have a feeling if I say it again, I'm just gonna butcher the name again, and that tends to piss a lot of people off. Well, the game is certainly unique, and interesting, and kinda lighthearted, and also, um, yeah, it's not really all that amazing. So here's the thing, obviously this is not gonna be a game that's gonna appeal to everyone, but as for me though, I mean, I kinda like it, but at the same time, it's also a pretty bare-bones game, even for an adventure-style game. Given that the puzzles are very simplistic and easy, and for the action parts that happen, which are very few and far between, are really not that challenging at all. And yes, you can die in this game, but the chances of dying in this game are very slim to none. Like, the only way you're ever really gonna die is if you just do it on purpose. So not only is the game really easy, but the game is also very short. I actually beat this game in like, two sittings. And chances are, once you beat this game, you probably won't play it again. Given that there's no choices you can make, or there's no multiple endings or anything like that. Not like I expected it to have a shit ton or anything, but yeah, okay, I know you guys are probably thinking I'm like shitting on this one, but the truth be told is that I don't hate this game, in fact I do kinda like it, but I just don't love it. And in a lot of ways, the game does remind me a lot of that SNES game that I reviewed called The Stories of Ihatavo. It was another adventure-style game that didn't have any action, and also did have a bit of a lighthearted story, and had some great music, and looked really good too. But one thing that that game has, that this one does not, is that it at least has a little bit of a challenge going on, for that some of the stuff that you had to do was a little bit tricky to figure out. Not stupidly impossible, but at least rewarding where this game really had no challenge at all. Like, honestly, the hardest part in the entire game was just bouncing around in this, like, floating island area trying to look for the damn broom. So overall, I'd say that this game is at the very least intriguing, but it also isn't anything mind-blowing, and I'm perfectly content with that. So yes, not an easy game I can recommend, but if it does sound interesting to you, it's at least worth a playthrough for at least just to see all the cool-looking settings and to also hear all the fantastic music, because damn, that really is the best part. So with that being said, that'll be the end of this review, so thanks for watching and commenting, and have yourselves a great day.